we're talking about the greatness of our God. We're dealing with creation versus evolution. Excuse me. Getting over a little cold. And we've been wrestling with it for a while. We'll be wrapping it up and within the next month. It'll all come to an end and we'll go on to something bigger and better, whatever the Lord has for us. And I look forward to, th- to see what that is. And I'm pretty, pretty certain where I know that's going to go. But I'm still praying about it. But we're wrestling with this and we're dealing with the concept, did God really do what he said? Do you believe that God did what he said he did? Do you believe that? I saw a great movie yesterday and you need to go see it. Please support Christian movies when you can. If you saw God's Not Dead, which was great, this is from the same company. It's up at the Rio called Do You Believe? And a very, very tightly woven story of 12 people and how their lives interact and how they encounter the Lord through their different circumstances. Super powerful. Please go see that. It was as good as God's Not Dead. I think the story's tighter. It's woven better. So please see that if you can. But that's the crux of where we've been for the last few months. What do you believe? Do you believe that God did what he said he did? If you can't believe this, and, uh, and in even I went to a creation science uh, gathering. They've got a group in Albuquerque. I went up there last week. And he even brought up that most people, most Christians, have somehow brought everything together. Somehow this, God did it in six days, but it really was 13.7 billion years. God made us from the dust of the earth, but it was really the ooze of the pond instead. And so this is what most people are believing. And you need to understand that God did what he said. And if he can't make the world, then he cannot send me a savior. Simple enough. So you've got lots of problems with the Bible and everything in it. Because I cannot believe in a savior. That's just as hard of a thing for me to fathom as a God who can create the world. It's almost easier for me to believe there's a God out here who created everything. Jesus is difficult for me. Because of his sacrifice and what he went through on my behalf? Why did he do that for me? I can see God wanting to show his creativity in making the world. But if you, if you have trouble with Genesis, the entire Bible is going to be a, 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 a difficulty for you. So I'm wanting you to get down to truly understanding what you believe. Did God do it or if he didn't? And if he didn't, I can work with you because I know where you stand at that point. But don't put them together like this because they cannot stand on top of each other. The world's philosophies cannot stand on top of God and what he said in his word. They cannot come together. Oil and water, as best as we may try to mix them, you let that thing stand, stand, it's all going to separate right back out. And God's going to be on top every time. It's a beautiful thing. So our, our overall passage is in the book of Colossians, so 1.16. And we've said it enough times, and I hope you get this thing memorized, but you've got a few more weeks to get there. But say this with me. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Do you believe that? Amen. If you believe that, we know where we are. If you don't, then you've got trouble with Genesis, you've got trouble with the book of Amos, you've got trouble with Jeremiah, Ezekiel, the book of Acts, and evidently the book of Colossians is where we've been so far. Psalms and Proverbs, we talked about that too. So I'm giving you real difficulty with your Bible. Now when you wrangle, when you debate, when you wrestle with a person of the world, I want to show you and reveal to you a few of their tricks. Okay. Now when somebody comes in my office, I can tell real quickly what they're trying to do. Either they're trying to find out really about this question or they're trying to get me all flustered. And I don't usually get flustered very easily, okay? Because I understand the tricks and I'm going to keep you on track. You're not going to get me all wander where I don't even know which way is up. It's not going to happen. When you come in, I'm going to answer the one specific thing you're wanting me to ask and I'll write down the rest of them. Okay, we're starting here. You, you said you brought this up, you brought this up, you brought this up. We'll go there next. By that time, they don't want to mess with you anymore because they they know they've they've lost the argument. But let me tell you a few of their techniques, okay? If you're a debater, you're on the debate team in college or in high school, you'll have heard some of these. The first one's a blind appeal to authority. They're going to do something like that. It's an authority stating that something that something happened is true because this person said it was true. Again, Richard Dawkins said it, or Carl Sagan said this, Stephen Hawking, the most genius person in the world, said this. It has to be true. Just because they say something doesn't make it true. It makes an opinion. I deal with facts. And I'm not going to deal just because Carl Sagan said that all there is is the, the universe, they're all there was and there ever will be. Blah, 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 blah. That's how he kind of spoke. It does not make it true. It makes it his opinion versus truth. And so don't, be, don't fall to blind appeal of authority. When they throw out those names, don't be impressed. 
Again, it's easy for us to say, oh, I can't fight with all those letters and those degrees past that name. No. Understand opinion and understand fact. The next one is selective use of evidence. And this is where most of the, the court cases have been dealt with over the last 150 years. But just because one fossil looks like another does not mean they came from the same animal. Just because they kind of look close. A motorcycle and a bicycle are two very different things, but both have two wheels and a seat. Okay? One's going to go a lot faster and have a lot more fun on it. Okay? But understand that's what it is. Do not allow them to just selectively use evidence to prove their point. You've got to keep them off track. Don't be impressed. And again, the one thing I always remind you, do not be impressed with their argument. Oh, wow, that's so great. No. Stand up. You're not any more intelligent than I am. We're going to talk this thing through. I don't care about Carl Sagan. I don't care about what looks like on the bones, these things that look kind of close. That's not what I'm impressed with. Let's, let's think about something else. The next one, here's a big one where they mostly go. An ad hominem argument. An ad hominem is in the Latin. It means to the man. What they're going to go is go to you. They're not dealing with the fight anymore. They're dealing with the religious zealot. Okay? Again, those who defend creation will often be personally attacked. Just because someone believes in God does not mean they can't speak to science. We have so many intelligent men and women around the world with lots of pedigrees that we would all dream of that love the Lord and are trying to prove Him in all aspects of their life. Next week I will be showing you and revealing to you what is happening to these people who speak up. That's where we're going next week. I've kind of given you enough proof. I could be here till God comes back. At some point, I've got to call an end to it and say, you take the data and move on. But I want to show you what the world does to these people. But they're going to attack them personally. It's the quality and testability of evidence which must determine its validity. A good scientist will only use the data at hand and not, not dealing with you. I don't care if you're a Christian or not. What kind of data do you have? Or if you're a secular person and you don't even love the Lord at all, show me your scientific data. Show me your points. We'll, we'll deal with those things and those things only. The next thing, straw man argument. As a position is, let me go back. I'm sure I've skipped one. Testable conclusions. There's a difference between interpretation and facts. Just because Carl Sagan has said the cosmos is all there is or ever was or ever will be does not make it fact. It makes it opinion. When someone speaks, their information must be testable. Okay? Let these people prove themselves to you. I don't care about what they say. I don't, I'm not concerned about their words. Show me the data. Show me the money. Okay? Going to straw man argument. A position is, is distorted, and then the distortion is then attacked. Now, I'm, I'm pretty good at this, and my wife gets real frustrated at me. I'm a straw man argument guy all day long. I'm going to take you to the extreme and see if it still, hand, still can handle itself. She gets real mad at that. She throws a fit every time I do it. But they will, uh, these person will eventually make an argument of religion versus science. Every time. They're not going to discuss the data. They're going to say, you're a religious zealot. I'm not going to deal with you because you're a crazy, wacko Christian who loves God. Okay? That's where they're going to go. So don't let them go there. Stand strong. Bring me your data. We're not talking about religion or God at this point. Show me the points. Show me the numbers. The last one this morning, there are lots of these, is begging the question. Asking a question to which you already have assumed an answer. Don't let them get there. Don't let them control the argument. They're going to lead you down a path that will get you away from where you want to be. Creation is a myth. There was no flood. And all animal life has evolved from a common source. That's begging the question. By defining science to exclude supernatural intervention, which most scientists, if they're going to be honest, have to say there's got to have been something bigger than us. By doing that, evolutionists have begged the question by eliminating the truth before they've started the debate. That's what happened in the Scopes Monkey Trial in 1925. They begged the question that this stuff was all religion. We're not talking about religion. Let us talk about the world at hand. And so by eliminating that, we never got to discuss it. It was never part of the argument. And the case was lost because of that, with reference to us. And so don't let those kind of things happen. Learning a few debating techniques is a good thing, and you must be ready to fight people when they come because there's nothing better than letting, getting someone who's ready to go, getting them off track. If I can tell you one thing, stay right where they are. Don't let them wander. If they came into you and dealing with this one thing, deal with the one thing until there's nothing else to say about it. And then go to their point two. It's an easy way to work. We're in the book of Acts. So open up there, written by Luke. Get your Bibles out if you've got them. A.D. 62. Again, we're before the fall of the temple. And so we're seeing the early church. 
the book of Acts was written to trace the development of the body of Christ over the generation from Christ's resurrection to Gentile membership. It's a great book. If you like history, read the book of Acts. There's so many great books in the Old Testament. But it is like the history of the New Testament. It takes us from the Gospels and what Jesus was doing. Jesus goes up to spend time with his father. We've got this next 30 years. What happens before Paul really starts writing to the churches? This is telling us how that church came about and what kind of sacrifice those people had to make. So we're in Acts 17. We're finishing last week's sermon. Again, it was just too good. I couldn't do it all in one week. So please stand with me. Acts 17, 27 to 29. We'll stand as we honor God's word. He did this so they might seek God and perhaps they might reach out and find him. Though he's not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist as some Even if your poets have said, for we also are his offspring. Being God's offspring, then we shouldn't think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image fashioned by human art and imagination. Let's pray. Dear Lord, you're almighty, and I thank you for Paul, and I thank you for his wit. I thank you for the psychology and the debating techniques he's using, Lord. Let us be as smart as he is when we, those people, come to us, Lord, so that we can share your truth in a way that they will understand. We say this in your name. Amen. Please be seated. Let me bring you up to, up to date. A little bit of back story. Kind of remind you. If you missed last week, it's on the website. But you can, uh, let me bring you up to date where we are. We remember from last week, Paul is stuck in Athens. Again, that would have been a neat city to see in the first century. A lot of beautiful architecture. It would have been a pagan city. But a lot of beautiful architecture to, to look at and to behold. But he's stuck there. He's waiting for Silas and Timothy to, to start his next Next, essentially, missionary journey. Of course, when Paul's down, he's always going to be preaching. So Paul's normal modus operandi, the way he always works, is he goes to the the temple or the synagogue first. He wants Jesus' as God's Jewish people to hear the story first. Sadly enough, every time they reject him, and he heads off to the Gentiles because they have no hope. The Jews think they have hope in their old traditional system that Jesus has now completed But he goes on to the Gentiles. He knows they will hear him. He gets an opportunity to speak at the Areopagus, Mars Hill. And it's a place where people just sit around to think. It used to be an important political area within within Greece. But at this point, it's just a place, a a nice park where everybody can. Sits and talks. And they learn new ideas. While there, he sees an idol. You can guarantee there's all these, the pantheon of the gods up at this beautiful park setting, all of them. Some of them very large, some of them very small, all of them titled. And at the last, at the end of this, he finds one. Who knows? I'm always going to guess it's some small one because they're not going to make a bigger god than Zeus. So it's some small little pedestal thing here. It says to the unknown god. When he starts speaking to them, he reminds them that the God they don't know anything about is essentially the God that made everything. The one that you don't know anything about is actually bigger, maybe even though you've made him smaller in stature, he's bigger than all the rest of these gods, and he ought to have a more prominent place. Let me tell you about this God. This is great debating technique. He found a way in. Every time we speak with someone, we should find an easy way in. No matter what it is, it's something around you. You're seeing something. How do I compare this to where I am? How do I share Christ's story to this person? Because they're really not wanting to hear it, but I can get it in if if I talk about the lingo they're wanting to hear about. Again, it's amazing how many just riding a motorcycle. I've gone to a lot of motorcycle rallies with these really nasty looking tough old boys, and they will talk to you all day as long as you've got a bike. You don't have a bike, they don't want to hear it, but they will t- they'll talk about God, they'll talk about the things they don't like about God, they'll tell the, your li- their life stories, as long as you're one of them. It's amazing how these kind of things work. So find that connection. Paul does it by this simple God at the end. He says the God that you don't know anything about, this little one called the unknown God, he doesn't live in shrines or he's served by man. Again, we've talked about what the uh, the Greeks at that point thought about Zeus and, and Hera and all these other, other gods of their lives. The God that you don't know anything about is the God that gives life and the one that gives breath to all things. The God they don't know anything about, this one here at the end who's small, made the nations and gives us time to live and, and areas that we can enjoy and beauty around us. That pretty much brings us up to date to where we are this morning. The first thing I want you to know as we talk about this great passage and we'll come back to it at some other time and to deal with it at a whole different angle because the psychology is so good here. But the first thing I want you to know is God is purposeful. Verse 27. 
He did this, God, so they might seek God and perhaps they might reach out and find him. Though he's not far from each one of us. Again, he's just being very passive. He's using their language, their lingo. He says he did this. Now this is what he did before. The things we just talked about. He made the nations. This unknown God that loves you so much that is doing these things for you. This is the one that made the nations, that gave length to your life. That gives you the land that you can put this crazy temple up on and you can talk all day long in this beautiful park. This is the God that did these things for you. But it's even more than that. He made heaven and earth. This is the God that you think is small, the one that you're just an afterthought, kind of one of the uh, the uh, footnotes in the book. This is the one that should have the title on the front of the book because he's the big one. He made it all. Just his sheer nature is what he did. He did this. Just being who he is is enough. We don't serve him, but we get to worship him. This is the God that we're talking about. Again, he's kind of starting to bring this argument to a close. He's reminding them of where he's been. Where he's been. Get, God did all of this. He did this so that we might seek him. We might seek him. And sadly enough, we are so di- distracted in the world we're in. You look at the beauty. I mean, just look at the vehicle out there. My goodness, the technology and the genius so that we can travel from one place to the other. To see God gave us that intellect. He did these things so that we might seek him. He wants us to love him. He wants us to worship him and give him truly his due. The word seek here is the word phalosphao in the Greek. And it means to fumble or grope around like a blind man. That you, that you might seek him. Now, you might think this makes God aloof. If you read it wrong, it might make you think that God's out there and he's not wanting to be found. Just as soon as that person gets close, he kind of gets out of the way, walks around to the back. No. The reason they are fumbling around and groping around is that their sin is keeping them from seeing the true light. Their eyes are darkened. We've all been in a fog. Again, some of the worst accidents in America have occurred in a, people driving right into a fog bank. Can't see a single thing. Just going to keep driving. Eventually it's going to stop. 20 miles later it may stop, but I'm going to keep driving. These are not necessarily safe ways to drive, but we understand the concept that all of a sudden you can't see anything around you. Or you've been totally in the dark. If you've ever been in a deep cave and they've turned out the lights, that's always one of their techniques. To see you can't even see this thing right here. It's so dark. They're groping around. They're fumbling around like a blind person because their sin keeps them from seeing the truth. That light is turned off. Again, our, our, our sin keeps us from turning on the light bulbs and walking to where God is. And we fumble around because we choose to keep ourselves in the dark. This is what he's saying. And they would have understood all of this. Again, we kind of have to explain it and get the, the rich meaning. He was speaking right to them. They're up here thinking they're so wise with all of their intelligence, much like we are today. Our, many of our scientists and our, our theologians out there, they're so wise, they know so much. And yet they're fumbling and groping around in the dark. This is what he's telling them. God is there at all times, and he wants them to find him. He's doing all he can to say, guys, just turn around, turn the light on. I want you to find me. Here I am as they are fumbling. He's, he's getting in their way, but they're looking over, and then he gets in their way, and they're over here. They're sitting here wandering and and meditating and contemplating the universe and missing the most important thing right in front of them. The simple thing that somebody carved at one point. I'd love to meet that guy. You know, he didn't even know what he was carving. Just making this thing up. And yet we're talking about it thousands of years later. What a neat thing. He did this so we might seek God and perhaps they might reach out. He's been very passive. He's not beating these people with the truth. He's hitting them where they are with the psychology and the heart that they have at the time. It's clear that man's looking just not that hard, perhaps. Again, these guys are up here talking about everything they can think about. They're probably talking about every bit of any God they know anything about. They've probably discussed all the religions that they know anything about. They've never had anybody like Paul come and tell the truth. So I can guarantee they're they're intrigued, they're piqued with reference to what he's speaking about. But it's kind of like someone watching TV. Guys, I'm going to speak to you at this point. You're watching TV, you got the tray with the chips over here. You're so involved in it, you're kind of looking for your chips, but you don't really want to take your eyes off of what's going on. Oh, I'll, I'll find it later. Well, look, at the fact, look at that play. That was great. Where's, where's my chips? It's that kind of a thing. 
They're looking, just not that hard. You know, if they were just to turn their face, get away from the things they're dealing with here in the world, they might see him right in front of them. And all of a sudden their lives will be changed. Perhaps they might reach out, maybe, possibly, if they get around to it. This is where the world is. The world is distracted. These people were distracted with their genius, their knowledge of so many things. Much like we are today. We not, may not be marveling at our genius, but we're marveling at a television set when we could be reading God's Word. Or we're, we're marveling at uh, some soccer event or something like that, or football, or something our kids are in, but we haven't got time to go to church because these are more important. Got to make sure that kid can kick a ball. Good stuff. Perhaps they might reach out, though he's not far. Very, very passive. God is not far from these thinkers. He's just right there. They're reaching out. He's just right here. They just need to turn on their eye, open their eyes, and be revealed to truth, not just necessarily knowledge. I think there are sometimes two different things. God is truth. God's word is truth. Everything he says is true. Genesis 1, all of chapter 1 and all of chapter 2 is true. You need to get to that point where you believe it that way and you stand strong enough to say, I don't care what the world throws at me. This is not going to shake my faith. God did this thing and I believe it. This is where we need to be as God's people. He's not far. If they'll just open their minds and seek with their hearts, they will find Him. Romans 10.9, again, my favorite passage. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. There are a lot of people that think, and they just ruminate and they write many articles on what does it really take to know God? Romans 10.9. Simple. He didn't make this thing hard. He could have. God is, is omnipotent. He could have made it as difficult. We've got a 48-step process. All you have to do is confess with your mouth and believe that he was raised from the dead. Which again, if I have trouble with the Genesis account, that raising from the dead is a lot bigger deal to me. It really, maybe that's just me. It seems like if there is a God out there, he's going to want to show himself just by making stuff. But why would he send himself down in the form of his son to die for me? It doesn't even make sense. So I've got lots of problems with the Bible if I can't believe in Genesis. They're thinking about everything and not finding anything. Acts 17, 21. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners residing there spent their time on nothing else but telling or hearing something new. That's going to get you in trouble anyway. Just sitting there thinking. Most of us need to think less and work more. Okay? Now, you can quote me on that. James said this this day. They're thinking about everything but the right thing. That sounds like our evolutionists and our cosmologists of today. They would rather think about aliens than a God that is out there wanting to watch over his creation. Again, Richard Dawkins, he's the one that always jumps up, and he would believe there are aliens that seeded the planet however they did that. I don't even want to know that story. However they seeded this planet, he would rather believe in that than a God. But here's the, here's the crux of it. They would rather believe in that because those aliens left and they're not coming back. And they don't care what happens. If there's a God out there that loves this planet and created it for his creation, then he's watching each one of us. And at that point, we're accountable to him. Who wants to be accountable to someone? These people are too intelligent to be accountable to anyone. So they're going to wrestle and fight with that and find any way to keep God out of the equation. They're going to do that. They don't want anyone putting dictates on their lives, much like we do today. You saw this. These people in the first century did not want Paul telling them truly where the truth is because at that point they'll have to reconcile their lives with it. Same today. We're dealing with, again, I'm going to give you a few more points. Next week we'll have a few more points, and I'll be coming to an end very quickly. The legacy of the fossil evidence. I want to quickly go through, very quickly go through some of the skulls and bones they've found. You'll hear some of these words and recognize them. The word ramipithecus, if you've heard that, if you've been around any time at all biology. It was recognized as a direct ancestry of humans, the ones right before us. It's now established as a merely an extinct type of orangutan. Yet for two generations, they told us about Ramapithecus being the one that was before us. But as soon as they prove that to not be in, they'll find another one and we go with it. Going on to Piltdown then, we've also talked about him. Hyped as the missing link in publication for over 40 years. 
He was a fraud based on a human skull cap and an orangutan's jaw. Those orangutans get around. You know, you go to the zoo, all they do is lay around. They don't do a single thing when you're at the zoo. But evidently through the last 48 million years of history, they've been busy just all over the place. You look at Nebraska man, was a fraud based on a single tooth of a rare type of pig. Both of those two were in the, the Scopes Monkey Trial in 1925 as truth. And that's what set it where we as Christians lost that case. Essentially, we lost, we lost the war on that one. But you see that these two things were, were hailed as truth. Java Man, we've all heard about that if you've ever watched the Discovery Channel. Based on sketchy evidence of a femur, a skull cap, and three teeth found within a wide range, somewhere around 200 feet, over a one-year period, and at different layers in the dirt. But they put them together, it's got to be one person. He just fell apart in different times, okay? It turns out the teeth were found in an area of human remains, and now the femur is considered to be human. Skull caps of a large ape. Those suckers were everywhere, just all over the place. Neanderthal man, or some of you would say Neanderthal man, traditionally depicted as a stooped ape man, it's now accepted that the alleged posture was from disease and that the Neanderthal is just a variation of the humankind. Another one of us, just kind of bent over. Australopithecus afarensis, Lucy, anybody heard about Lucy, has been considered a missing link for years. However, studies of the inner ear, skulls, and bones have shown that she was merely a pygmy chimpanzee. But she's still sweet, got a nice name. Homo erectus, he's smaller than the average human of today, yet the brain size is very much within, would range within this room. Some of you think it a lot, some of you aren't thinking as much. That kind of a thing. But they've checked the middle ear and they've shown that it's just like us. They consider us to be Homo sapiens. Australopithecus africanus, another variation, and Peking man, some of us have heard of Peking man, presented as eight men missing links for years are both now considered Homo erectus, which is essentially Homo sapien. Us, you and me, just at different points in the world. Homo habilis, generally considered to be the comprised of pieces of various other types of creatures such as Australopithecus and Homo erectus, and it is not generally viewed as a valid classification at this time anymore. Every one of these have been found to be faulty and wrong. And yet we, they'll just, they'll, they will not, I would be embarrassed. They, would, they just continue to move on. Well, if that's not it, we'll find one out there. All it's done is made us want to hunt more. We'll see if we can get away from the orangutan area and maybe we can find one that actually is human this time. In 2002, anthropologists announced a skull they found in Chad and, and had an unusual mixture of primitive and human-like creatures' features. It was dubbed Tumai and was immediately hailed as the earliest member of the human family found so far. July, August, October, no, September, October, what is that, three months later? A number of scientists declared it to be merely a, a fossil of an ape. Three months, it was the best thing ever. Three months later, it's now just an ape fossil. These are what your people are telling you, and they're telling your children, and they're telling your grandchildren in school as fact. And just as soon as they prove this next one to be false, they'll find another one, make it a new name, and claim it to be for a generation or two the missing link. Understand they don't know that much. Again, this, this, I wish I could bring all of this lecture I heard the other night, but statement after statement after statement of their own scientists are saying they no longer need to prove anything of evolution. They know they can't. It's obvious. Their own statements are saying we can't prove it, but we know it to be fact, so we will live with it. This is what the world is saying. When I know what the facts are, God made the world in six days and he rested on day seven. This is not hard. It's not hard, especially when you look at the scientific evidence showing that everything that is about us could have been done in that period of time. God is purposeful. God is powerful. Verse 28, for in him we live and move and exist. And even some of your own poets have said this, for we are also his offspring. For in him we live and move and have our being. Excuse me. This is a quote from a 6th century B.C. poet, Epimenides of Gnosis in Crete. 600 years earlier, he's quoting from one of their own poets. It was said at, at this point, this uh, Epimenides, he was tending his father's sheep one day, and he fell asleep in a Cretan cave and fell asleep for 57 years. Just fell asleep. Really good sleep. A lot of good dreaming going on over the next 57 years. Okay? 
after all of this, because this special cave was sacred to Zeus, he woke up with the ability to have the gift of prophecy. I would think there'd be other problems after being asleep for 57 years. But he woke up just, I can see stuff, this is great. And this is what he said. Now, I'm not sure about all the words in the history of him. That's kind of interesting. But we can apply it to Yahweh God. For in him we live and move and have our being. Paul's using their own speakers, their own people against them to help prove that this unknown God is the Yahweh God, the one they have no idea, but let me tell you about him. Use their own technology. Use their own research. Use their own information to share about God. Romans 14.8, if we live and we live with the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, we live and die where we belong to the Lord, no matter what we do. We belong to the Lord. In Him we have, we move and have our being. Without God forming us from the earth, we would have no life. We are also His offspring. In this one simple verse, he's quoting two different poets, their own Greek poets. Again, this comes from the 3rd century B.C., a Stoic author called Eratus. And Paul quoted, again, he quoted two of their own people. This is a reminder for us that general revelation can be found in contemporary things around us. There is wisdom out there. There is truth. They just may not recognize it. Or sometimes we need to use their truth to share the real truth, the truth of Christ and what he has done for us. This is where we need to be. Again, we need to know the difference, though. When you look at Aratus, for we are also his offspring. His, at this point, was Zeus. Paul's turning it totally around, upside down. No, this, Zeus isn't about Zeus at all. This is about that unknown God you don't know anything about. And if you'll listen, I'll tell you about him. Again, how many times have you had the opportunity to share? And we get on the Roman road and we get all shaky and nervous. And Romans 3.23, for God's sake, no. And then 6.23 and 5.8. Uh, ten nine. I don't remember. It's something about a heart and a mouth, but I love it all. When all we have to do is just relax and share what God has done for us. We don't need to know everything. Just how God has worked in my life. You know, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You, me, everybody, we've all fallen short. But the wages of sin, that, that problem, that, that wages is death. You don't want to die. You want to live. Let me tell you about living. Let me tell you where I was before. This is what it is to share. And you, you bring something off of their desk and talk about it, make a quick comparison, remind them of some, one of their great authors they enjoy to read or know something about this person and, and, and bring some of that into the story. At that point, it's real and it's theirs. Again, we, we know that Aratus was wrong in what he said. Zeus, we aren't Zeus's offspring, but we are God's. And Paul was smart enough to use things that they recognized and understood to share truth. You wouldn't think that this thing has pagan poetry in it. But we just showed you a verse that has two lines from pagan poets that did not love the Lord at all. We should know what's going on in the world. We need to use those things around them. The next thing I want to tell you about is something that really doesn't prove or disprove evolution, but I want to bring it up to you because several, several of you have been in my office asking about this called the gap theory. If you've heard the gap theory, give me a couple minutes to explain it. And I'll tell you why I think there's some difficulties because I didn't know much about it. I keep to myself. I just don't search around things. I've done some research to explain this. The gap theory came about in 1814 by a Scottish minister named Chalmers. I want you as Christian people to believe this and nothing else. But in the ninth, early 19th century, they were trying to deal with old earth and the Bible, which is where most of us are today. We're still trying to resolve how do we get 13.7 billion years out of six days. Most of us are still fighting that fight. Well, Chalmers thought he had the idea. Okay? Essentially, he believed there is a gap between Genesis 1.1 and Genesis 1.2. He believes there's a gap of maybe up to billions of years. Now, let me read those two verses to you. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Here's where he believes there's a gap in time. Now, the earth was formless and empty. Darkness covered the surface of the watery depths, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Now, I've reminded you that Genesis 2, chapter 2, is just a, simply a recapitulation of day 6. God made, the, God made all these things, and he made man. Oh, by the way, let me tell you how he made man in chapter 2. I think that's what happened here. Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, God made all of these things, the heavens and the earth. But let me back up and tell you how he did that. 
I think that's what's happening in God's Word. And you see that in, in Hebrew speak, because they'll always give the overall picture, then they'll backtrack and tell the subtleties behind it. But God made heaven, again, essentially, God made the heavens and the earth with reference to this theory. And then there were billions of years before the six days of creation. Again, if you're thinking this, if you're trying to resolve this, I want to at least wrestle with this for one minute with you. Now, this comes from the King James Version. Let me tell you where they get this and where his, his proof was. King James, Genesis 128. Genesis 128, there's a word in here that gives us trouble. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Now, if any of you have kind of wrestled with that, or if you read the King James, you may have thought through that. Say, what is the word replenish? Again, and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Okay, now I've told you the King James is a beautiful version. We're blessed to have it. But there are word problems from 1611 to 2015. We changed definitions. So Chalmers taught that the devil and his demons fell from heaven after Genesis 1-1 caused a real havoc on the earth and God had to start over. That's what his philosophy was. Again, we see in Ezekiel the, the devil falling. But here the devil makes a real mess of the earth and God has to just to start over and refill it. He had it full, Genesis 1-1, started it, we made the heavens and the earth and everything on it, it's all kinds of beautiful thing. The devil comes down and wreaks havoc. Can't get this thing back together. I've got to start over. Now, here's the problem with this. Okay, let me just wrestle with this. There's several problems. The Hebrew word for replenish is the word malay. Malay. The word replenish in the King James. It just means to fill. It does not mean to refill. Okay? Understand that. There is a, a Hebrew word, shana, which means to refill or to replenish, and they didn't use it. This is an English problem at this point. In 1611, the word replenish meant to fill when the King James was written. But even up to as early as 1650, the word replenish took on a new meaning. It took what we kind of look. It had that prefix on it, re, meaning to do something again. So they kind of started using the word differently. In 1611, it meant to fill. 1650 and on, it meant to refill. Okay. Now, this also gives us problem. If you believe this, it gives us problem with Genesis 131. God said all that he had made, and it was very good. Evening came and morning the sixth day. How can he say that everything was good if the devil came down and literally made a mess of it for 13.7 billion years? Got a problem with that. God's a liar, or he doesn't understand what good is, because I don't even think any part of that's good. If him having to start, start over. The last thing about this, we can't use death as a means for God to help with creation. And that's what we, essentially what it would be. When you look at evolution, is it teaches that death is part of the process that nature uses in order to continually promote each species and allow adaptation to the environment. Survival of the fittest. You have to have death for the next generation to be stronger. We can't use that for God. Again, the Bible clearly teaches that death is a result of rebellion. And I believe that of Satan and Adam's sin. We chose death. We didn't have to have death. And it's not something that God created during that time period that the gap theorists would say between 1-1 one, one and 1-2. One, Essentially, this theory also makes God responsible for evil, which we can't. God does not cause evil. God does not cause harm. God gives blessings. God loves his people. He does not bring bad things to his people. He will try us and he will make us stronger, but he doesn't bring evil or pain. The theory implies that God used the methods of death and decay on a global scale for billions of years in order to accomplish his unknown purposes in a primeval world. The only way that he could make us was through the death and the pain of that 13.7 billion years before. So, if you wrestle with that, you continue to think about it. You just need to understand we cannot work out problems of theology with an English version. You can't. You have to get to the Greek and the Hebrew because they're always clear. And if they're not, you have to look at the context of the time to maybe give you more information. Don't ever try to get some great theological thing from the English. Most cults come from using an English version. Translation of a translation, a copy of a copy of a copy, it just gets worse and worse and worse, depending on what the translator wants to do with it. So we've seen that God is purposeful. God is powerful. Finally, God is personal. Verse 29, when did I appear? Being God's offspring, then we shouldn't think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image fashioned by human art and imagination. 
being God's offspring. Paul is using imagery they would have understood. They believe themselves to be Zeus's children. He's changed that now to Yahweh, the son known God. You are his offspring, not Zeus. We've talked about that already, guys. Listen to me. It's this little one. You have no idea what it means. He's your father. He's the one who created all these things. Then, he's bringing it home at this point, the divine nature is not gold or silver or stone. God is not something we make or create or design. It's as intelligent as these men and women were, you would think they would understand that a, a marble sculpture gives you no power. In fact, I'm giving it power by creating it and giving it life on its own. These are beautiful statues, but they can't change a life. God is not the universe. God is not some other race on another planet. God is not money, power, or knowledge. God is the same God who made the universe and created man. Again, this is not just something I'm trying to teach as a pastor. I believe this. God is who he said he is. And the minute you can reconcile on that is the minute you can move on to bigger and better things in your life. He's not an image made or thought by man. We make ourselves out to be intelligent. We have such great understanding. Yet we cannot make God in our own image. Look at Acts 7. However, the Most High does not dwell in sanctuaries made with hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne and earth my footstool. What sort of house would you build for me, says the Lord? What is my resting place? They make these beautiful, beautiful temples, some of which we can still see today. Beautiful architecture. They're just as hollow as the day they were made. God does not reside there. He does not reside in his room. God is living and active in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. God is on his throne and Jesus is at his right hand right now. He has sent himself in the form of the Holy Spirit for anyone who has called upon his name. This is the God we serve. They've made gods for their own hands, yet those gods didn't make the earth. We cannot make gods of the universe, as Carl Sagan once would have said, or Stephen Hawking. We cannot make a God of our own beliefs or our ability. Do you understand that the, the writers and, and the, the people who wrote the Bible understand God to have done what he said he did? And do you also understand that that does not correlate with what the world says about evolution or creation? Two different separate things. These people understood that God created the world. He did it in six days. They knew that God worked in their lives. And that's the big issue here. If God can create something as beautiful as the world we live in, then he can work in each one of you and solve your issues. He can. He is a big God. And these are little bitty tiny things to him. Now, I know they're paramount to you. How's my relationship with my spouse? Are my kids going to come back to me? What am I going to do to eat? I've got no money coming in. God, are you going to provide and give us this great opportunity in the future to be able to use our gifts to give you glory? You're putting me on a shelf so that I can't do the things that, that I thought I've always been called to do. We all wrestle with these questions. But God is big, and God has a purpose. And that's where we need to get to as we wrestle with all these little goofy things and the, the funny things about skulls and whatnot. The big picture is here is what do you believe? If you believe God can do this, then maybe you can believe he can send his son to give you life. And that's where we need to be. I serve a big God. This morning, what do you believe?